is so good. Who was the, what was the name of the singer for that last one? Man, he's yes. been, he cranks out the best <laughs> music that, wow. Matthew West. Ah, we are in Luke 17. And remember, what Luke is telling us is what God wants us to understand, right? If, if he's telling us, uh, giving us a message, he is revealing himself to us, and it's for us to read and to comprehend and to understand so that it changes our life. Like I said, good theology leads to understanding and a comprehension of it. <clears throat> it changes our life daily. And, and here... Luke is reminding us as believers that <clears throat> Christ is revealing God's program to us of what's going to happen in the future. Um, I was just thinking, I, I just heard a song that I listened to back in the 1970s um, by Thin Lizzy, and it was called Angel of Death. Um, <laughs> But that song, I always love the music to it, but the lyrics are so depressing. Very depressing because it's uh, talking about the end of all things. The, just the common state of the 1970s, if you remember, everybody was looking toward the apocalypse. Of course, the book came out um, by Lindsay, Hal Lindsay about late great planet Earth and everybody and in the song it's mentioning Nostradamus and his predictions and at the end it's like do you believe this to be true it's like, no but anyway I know at the end's gonna end in some way so that that scared me that song really and put the fear of God in me and but this with their aunt get they they offered no answers here in the song but um, I, I was always searching for what is the future gonna hold because everything was painted but I knew that God existed. Christ had some part in that. And so it's like, I, I need to look into this because there seems to be where the truth is. And then God revealed to me, yeah, that's where the truth is at. That's where it's at. And here we're having Jesus himself, God himself revealing to us his plan, his program. And as we've read through this passage, and continue to read through this passage, he is laying out um, his program, his, his coming again, and his role of redemptive history, and he is the Messiah. He must come, suffer, and die. And so we've, we're going to see seven things pop out in these verses. I'm just taking you through as we read through them. Uh, Verse 20, um, this, this all came about here because the Pharisees are asking him sarcastically, when is this kingdom of God going to come? And they don't, they don't understand Christ is coming first and they, they don't believe in him at all. They reject him. And so Jesus replies by saying the coming of the kingdom of God is something that can be observed. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, the kingdom of God is internal right now. I am preparing a people of my very own. That's what Titus uh, uh, chapter 2 says. That he has um, redeemed a, a people for his very own from wickedness that he's going to return to. And then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will no longer, s or you will, you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see me. Uh, you will not see it. And it, it's that great desire of the church that we long and, and oh, just, just give me a glimpse of, I want to see one of those days where Christ 
is lifted up and glorified. And of course in the future people will tell you, there he is, here he is. Do not go running off after them. Because it's going to be visible. For the Son of Man in his day will be like lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. Okay, so it, it's going to be visible. You're not going to miss it. Um, the books of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians were written to the church because they had heard false teaching that Christ had come already. And he's like, it hasn't happened yet. Don't, don't be discouraged because you're not going to miss it. You're not going to miss it. And here Jesus himself, himself says, nowhere in the world is anyone going to miss this. They're not going to have to say, hey, look over there. Oh, he showed up over here in secret. No, it's going to be worldwide known. Worldwide known. Then he says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation or this genos, this race. These people are going to be reject me. And this is for preordained by God that he would be rejected by his own, his own people. And he must suffer. And that, that was the great question of the Jews, especially as you read through the Old Testament. They see the coming Messiah as the suffering servant, yet he's coming as king. It's like, how can you mesh those two ideas together? Well, God plays it out here. We see that, that he must suffer first, go away for a while, and return in the same way he left, as he told his disciples he would. So, we have that delayed that delayed expectation that he's coming in the future and it's put off. Do you remember why it's put off? I tried to explain that two weeks ago, all right? Um, it's because the rejection of the Jews and according to Romans, he cannot come until the body of Christ, this new extra program he's added in here to work in the world until the Jewish nation is called again until they repent and come to Christ as the Messiah. Um, we read in the book of Acts where he will not come until the full number of Gentiles have been brought into the church and then taken out and then Israel will begin their finish off their program. Seven years they still owe God. And that goes back to Daniel 9. Um, where it said until Israel the nation will be redeemed and saved um, they had to not pay off but um, pay the consequences for their sin and iniquity and when they do that in those seven years and they come to Christ and they declare him in the world it said then Christ will return to the earth. Okay. And like I said, I'm working through this biblically, in my mind, to make sure this is the process. And the more I'm studying, the more it's just, it comes out. It's, it's there. That God has a program for the church that He's fulfilling, and when that time is done, there is a last time for the church in this world. Um, we are living in the last days according to um, according to Peter. First Peter 1 Peter 1.17, it, it says, Since you call on a father who judges each, each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without lamb blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. So this, this whole time since Christ has been taken into heaven, ascended into heaven, until the last curtain call of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it talks about the church being taken out of this world. That the program has finished for the church. Well, there's also a last time for Israel. And so you really have to, dis there's a distinction between the two. It's all considered the last times, but uh, for the church, it's, it's separate. And, and it really comes out in these next verses that we look at here. In verse 26, he says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from the heaven and destroyed them all. So, this, this goes back to what Jesus is bringing out in these passages. It's about judgment, right? Um, he's talking to the Pharisees, and now he's explaining to his disciples. Because the Pharisees, they see the Messiah is coming and setting up this kingdom, overthrowing the shackles of Rome, and placing all these Jewish leaders in prominent roles in this future kingdom. That's and it's going to be a party and celebration in their eyes. Jesus is like, nah, it's not going to be like that at all. Actually, finishes fin finishes this out by saying, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. That doesn't sound like a party to me, right? That that is, he's talking about judgment here. And so, just as in the days of Noah, <clears throat> so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That, in other words, it's, it's going to be completely unexpected. People will be living out their lives normally. Um, eating, drinking, marrying, be, being given it. They're going on. Life is normal. Life is normal. And if we go back to Noah and think about that time where, I mean, there's millions of people there. People are living a thousand years. Do you remember that? I mean, we don't always piece those things together, but we're talking about generations living. Um, you know your grandfather, your great-grandfather way back because they're still alive. And, uh, and so Noah's preaching... It, it, Peter says he's the preacher of righteousness. The uh, book of Hebrews said he was a righteous man. He is preaching God's truth during that time. And, it, and God says everyone's wicked and evil in the world. So bad that he has to intervene and judge the world. And so just in the days of Noah where wickedness was everywhere that is going to be unexpected kabam um, where Noah is warning I'm, that's what Noah was preaching was a warning God's sending a flood he's going to make it water cover the earth back then the environment the water rose from the ground but if this was all going to change where rain and the earth would be covered by 
And so judgment just came swiftly upon them as he entered the ark with his family. And people were going on like nothing. Eh, it's okay. Going on, doing their thing. Um, then the flood came and destroyed them. And in the same way, with Lot and his family, in Sodom, and the angels came to him to tell him to get out of the city. He he was he was called the righteous person according to the book of Hebrews, and uh, in doing research and study, I I just happened to look up the verses and, and a website popped up and said, how could Lot be righteous living in Sodom and and they go on and on talking about behavior and you read through it, it's like they don't even understand what righteousness is, that it's given by God and it's not earned, it's not deserved. Um, but it says, Peter says, Lot was righteous. So I leave it at that. He was deemed righteous and here he's put in the same place of Noah that he is escaping the judgment of God in time before it happens unexpectedly in the world. And of course, the destruction on Sodom was fire and sulfur. It rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It was from God's hand. The flood was from God's hand. These catastrophes happen because it's God's righteous judgment on this world uh, for wickedness. But... He saved people, those who were his own. I mean, that's something we can always rely on, that God will protect those, are for, those who are his own. And when it's our time to go home, it's our time. He's called us. We're okay with that, right? But as long as we're drawing breath, we're here to warn and declare God's glory is His Son, and also judgment is coming. And these, these analogies here of Noah and Lot, they appear in different times. Um, in the book of Jude, they both pop up there. And it's talking about the days of judgment. And Jude, very short book, right? There's no chapter, so you can just name verse there. And Jude just goes through and he He's talking to the church. And Jude is Jesus' brother. Half-brother, right? James and Jude. James, his brother, not James and John. A different disciple. But Jude here, who writes at the beginning of Jude, he said, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus, brother of James, which is very intriguing. He doesn't want to say, hey, I'm, I'm Jesus' brother. He, doesn't. he said, I'm a servant of the one I grew up with. That, that is amazing. And so you read through the book of Jude. He's talking about the church, especially the last days of the church, that evil will, will get worse and worse and worse. Um, there will be people that will come into the church. They are going to pretend that they are they're saved or they're, they're God's people, and yet they're unregenerate. They, they don't know the Holy Spirit. And they don't, they don't hold the same moral values, the whole the same scripture. I mean, you see that today. The, the churches are opening themselves up to immorality, saying in, in the name of love for people, we need to accept these behaviors. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. Um, in the last days, people will be deceived and lovers of himself. It goes through in 1 Timothy um, chapter 3. People will be lovers of themselves having a form of godliness yet denying its power. That, that's it right there. That They have it all shown on the outside. I'm a very good person and very moral according to my morality. 
my new morality, and yet I have denied that power behind it. That's the Holy Spirit. They have not allowed that Holy Spirit to come in, and they haven't broken themselves down to say, I have nothing before God. I need Him. I need your mercy. You know, what Jesus has been talking about this whole time. Uh, a, a brokenness, of uh, a surrender. Bankruptcy. That's when God comes in and saying, I cannot save myself. I need the Savior. And He comes in. And so it's saying they have rejected the Holy Spirit. And so this is going to become more and more prevalent as time goes on. As we get to chapter 21, Jesus is going to bring up his return again. It will go more in depth at that time with, with the timeline and process. But he says there that there is uh, birth pains. Bah, 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 bah. It's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger through time until he comes. And, and it's, each time it's a warning shot. Boom, boom, boom. All through history. Every time there's something that is cataclysmic or, or something goes wrong, I always go back to Jesus talking about when that tower fell over on people. They're like, were those people being judged by God? He said, it doesn't matter. What you should do is repent. Repent and believe in me. That's the bottom line on it all. Of any judgment, any tribulation in life, even for the believer, as we go through daily tribulations, it's, it's always a reminder, whoa, I'm acting in my own accord. I need to turn to you, Lord. I surrender to you. Surrender, surrender, surrender. I submit to you. I submit to your law. I submit to your Holy Spirit. I submit to your program and work through me. So, Tribulation for us is always a good thing. Always a good thing. That's why James is counted joy in all your tribulation. Because it is, it is working inside of you. And Peter says it's refining you uh, like gold through the fire to, to pull off the dross. Those things, that, that stuff inside of us, that old man, that ungodness, so we can clothe ourselves with Christ. So that's always the work. But to the world, it's a warning shot to them of, there's something bigger going on here. And Jesus said, there's coming a time when judgment will just be poured out on the world. And it's going to come unexpectedly. But for you who believe, like Noah, like Lot, you're going to be protected. You're going to be taken out of it. Um, Noah's Ark is such a great illustration of Christ and the church. Him being... His body and us being united with Him, lifted up out of judgment's way. The whole story of the ark is a picture of salvation, where we're called to enter in through the door, right? All the animals went in, and God told Noah, go on in. Noah and his family went in, they didn't shut the door. Who shut the door? God, God shut the door, sealed them in safely to carry them through the judgment. Above the judgment. Right? Above the judgment. They weren't harmed in any way. They were lifted up over it. Which is a great picture of God taking the church out. Lifting them up out of the judgment that He has reserved for the nations of this world who have hindered Israel their entire existence as a nation. And um, there's specific nations, he points out, seven of them that he is targeted in this judgment, for sure, that have been a, a, the thorn in Israel's side in the future. And anyway, that's down another rabbit hole. So, um, so we're seeing a picture of that, of Lot, you know, Lot, did he deserve this? No, it's all grace. But he was considered a righteous man. And his family, they left. Now, 
not on me, it, but that's going to come up here again. But it, it's that they're getting out of town, out of Sodom and Gomorrah, to a neighboring city that's going to be a place of safety before the judgment hits. And Jesus said, to point out here, the judgment's coming, but it's going to be unexpected. People are going to be living their lives like, like nothing's happening. And then it's going to come. So then verse 30, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Now this is the revelation of Christ to the world. He said it's going to be like that. It's going to be unexpected. I will be revealed in this world. You know, when I, when I look at this, when we see the rapture of the church, he's going to be revealed to the church. We're going to be called up and pulled up in the air to meet him. And Christ isn't revealed to the world at that time. But, on this day, when the Son of Man is revealed, now it's going to talk about a whole different revelation of Christ that um, He's going to be revealed in the world. Uh, the word apocalypse. I mean, that has that word, just apocalypse. Does that sound like a fun, kind word? All it means is revealing, uncovering. That's, that takes all the teeth out of apocalypse, right? Um, apocalypse mean, apocalypsis means to reveal, like to take the cover off. And so what Jesus is saying here, I'm, I'm going to be revealed to the world who I really am. No more build a bear Jesus of what people think I am. I'm going to be revealed as I am. As the Savior, the one who shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world, and yet was put in the grave, and yet was risen on the third day. And now I am ascending and they're going to see me in my glory and honor. It's like Pharisees. <laughs> That's when I'm coming. I'm, I, I'm going to be revealed who I truly am. And That's the apocalypse. The revealing. And really, this is a time of revealing. It's going to disclose the hearts of everyone on that day. Um, because in verse 31 it says, On that day no one who is on the housetop with possessions in shot side should go down to get them. Like, no, likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. So, it's, it's a time of revealing of mankind's hearts as well. Um, he's reminding us of Lot's wife who had the potential to be saved and to get out of town. But her decision to look back, we think, she just looked back. What's wrong with that, right? She just looked back. But God told her, don't look, just go. But what it reveals is her heart. She's thinking about what I've left behind there. That, that's the key to this passage. And it really goes in line with Jesus' parables about uh, the seed, the word being the seed, that but when it, when it falls in the rocky soil um, it, it, it tries to grow for a little bit but because of its longing for the world and, and the things of the past or the tribulations that come it it dries out in the heat of the day and doesn't have any moisture to continue its growth. It's, it's that 
person who comes to Christ not understanding the full righteousness, but they see it as, yeah, this could be a way. And they make, oh yeah, they go through the motions, but really in their heart, they haven't set apart Christ as Lord and, and understand the true salvation. So they've, they've started down that road of tracking with Jesus, but because it came, became so hard, uh, this isn't really going to work for me. Okay, I, I can rely on other things than God. They turn away from the gospel. Or um, they get into it and their love for the world is like, oh man, I, I forgot. That, that's really what Lot's wife here is like, I'm remembering, I don't want to leave my life. Um, that's, that's my life there. That's where I belong. So it's a revelation of a heart here that Jesus is exposing. This will come out in Luke 21, that this, this verse here on, the day, um, on that day when Christ comes back, whoever's on the housetop with possessions inside, don't go down to get them. Run. Run for the hills. And he's talking to Israel as the nation at this point. Um, that Jerusalem will be attacked. And you have judgment's going to befall that area with the Antichrist. And everything happened. Just run for the hills to where I'm going to save you. And that's, that's yet future. And we'll get more into depth on that as we get to Luke 21. Um, but remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? She got caught in the judgment as well. She turned her back on what God had said. She did not continue to that faithful, saving place of safety. And then Jesus says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. And, and this is this is he, he's already said this before in Luke. He, he's saying if, if, if you want to hold on to your life, hold on to you as king of your life, your possessions, your desires, your goals, everything, you're going to lose your life in the future. Um, but whoever loses their life now, that's talking about taking up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Daily, 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 daily. He said, those people who have died have been buried with me. I mean, the day that I came to Christ, I died. The day you come to Christ, you die. The person that you know as Justin Welch, you died when you came to Christ. Die. You consider yourself dead. I am no longer king of my life. I am no longer me. I'm, I am now a new creation in Christ. I have been raised with Christ. And the real me now is here and alive. And every day I gotta beat off that old old man that wants to keep taking over the throne. And that's what Jesus is talking about though, that there that you, you there's a point in your life you have to come to the end of yourself and come to me, surrender and lose your life. Does that make more sense now? The losing your life? Because for me for years I never quite understood that and I'm getting a better grasp on it. Of, of losing your life. I'm losing my choice, my decision to fulfill my pleasures, my, my goals and dreams, and I've exchanged them on a daily basis, right? Daily basis. Because they're still there, the pleasures of this world, uh, the things of this world, and yet the real me delights in God's Word. Delights in Him. Delights in righteousness. Delights... It does not delight in evil. But loves the truth. That, that's what love is all about. God's love. And... 
you understand what it means to follow Christ, to follow Him. You lose your life. So he reminds, again, this is another warning shot to the Pharisees. Really, a point of grace to them, extended out to them. Look, you need to lose your life. Otherwise, you're going to lose it in the future. Read, read Jude. When you go home, read Jude. I, I, I brought it, printed out. I was going to read through it because it's, it really it tells us to be wary of people like the Pharisees today that have infiltrated the church and do not know Christ and yet proclaim to know Him. Um, and it says there that they are dead twice. That they are dead spiritually and they're going to be dead physically. Um, and here we take the death first with Christ. We get to live eternally. So, anyway, the whole book of Jude, I'm, I wanted to go through that as well, but um, it's such a fantastic, small, power packed uh, book of truth, especially for the church. Um, so, we have a divisive part of this now. He said, I tell you, on that night, two, pe two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken in the left, in the other left. He said, I'm, I'm going to divide this world. We know that Jesus did not come to bring peace to this world. He came to divide it. That's his very own words. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to, because of me, I'm going to come in between a family that people are going to hate me and people are going to love me. Those who love me are going to be hated by those who hate me. That's the way of this world. And he's, he's divisive in that sense because he's called us to be holy as he is holy. Um, it separates us. The word holy means separate. You're separate from the world. So many verses that play into all this. Uh, but here, he's saying, I'm, I'm going to separate out people. And we know during the time of the rapture, that's going to happen. People are going to be, the church, believers in Christ will disappear off this world, out of this world. And there'll be no explanation for it other than what some have heard or the other ideas that come forth during that time. I'm sure Antichrist will take full use of whatever um, he feels would be the best way to use it. Um, but there's a dividing nature here. Those who are believers will go off with him and those who are not will go in through the judgment. Um, but here as well, when he comes again in Revelation, people are going to be divided again. Um, he gives the parable of, of the tares and the weeds, the wheat, how they're mixed together, but he says about the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. He said, when I come again and return to the earth, I'm going to separate people out that... The goats are going to be on my left. The sheep will be on my right. And those who follow me will enter into the kingdom where the others will go on to eternal judgment. Because, really, when you think of that time of the tribulation, those are the greatest warning shots to people in this world of chaos, of because at the same time that chaos and judgment is going on in the world, you've got an angel, according to the book of Revelation, circling the globe, proclaiming the gospel. You have two witnesses in Jerusalem proclaiming the gospel who are killed and then raised up and continue to pre preach the gospel. 
Um, you have the Jews dispersed through the world. The 144,000 are going to go out and preach to the world. I mean, the Gospel's on the flow everywhere and explaining what's going on in the world. And yet, people, they have that time to repent. And so, even with the increased judgment of God, the increased grace of God is right there with it. And that's why he's saying to them, where you see carnage, deadliness here, that's how he finishes up, when they say, where, Lord, where is this all going to happen? He's going to say, when you see this carnage in the world, know that my grace is right there along with it. Because I am God. I'm a God of judgment and a God of love and grace and mercy and compassion. Again, this is a warning to the Pharisees, the, the legal lawyers, the religious people of that time to repent, to, to see Jesus in a different light and have that complete change of mind, change of heart. He said, where that dead body is, there the vultures will gather. So this is the deadly part of it. Um, and I know people say, how can God do this to the world? But the really the answer is, how can God be so gracious to the world as well? Because we are so undeserving of anything He gives us. Anything. It's in that song there. It's like, why do you put up with me, God? That, that, is, the, that is my biggest why in the world. If, if I could ask, it's because He's a loving God who loves His Son so much that He gave Him for us. I, I'm, I don't mean to twist that. But really, God loved Himself so much that He wanted to bring all people in with Him. I'm not trying to be heretical here. I'm saying that God, God in His perfect love and righteousness wants to share this with all those who would come to Him. And so Christ was given for us. Um, not for the old dead man that He was. He was given for me who's being revealed, who is in Christ because I have nothing without Him. Right? That is the greatest question to ask, greatest miracle in the world. God, why? Why do you keep putting up with me daily? And it's to remind us of who He is. That He is a saving, loving, gracious, merciful God. And no matter how far I run, no, uh, He's right there. Oh, God, I can't get away from You. I can't. And why would I? <laughs> right? Why would I? That is the beauty of the Christian life that it makes me want to serve Him more and more. As, as terrible as I am, and as gracious as He is, day after day. That song, I'm saying, is such great theology that we heard of God being the stained God. God of stain. Isn't that beautiful? You pray. <laughs> ah! Ah! And so we can never be overcome with questions of like, how could God be so judgmental? And It's like, how could God be so gracious? I'll never forget. I, I just saw... I don't know if you know who R.C. Sproul is, but he's a teacher I, I enjoy. He's passed on now. He's, he's, he's in the presence of the king, which makes me happy, because um, that's who he longed to see. And during one of his questions and answers once, somebody brought up the question of, uh, you know, since God is so loving, compassionate, gracious, why was he so hard on Adam when he made the wrong choice? Why, why did he bring down the world and, and make Adam die when he sinned? And he, that what, wasn't God harsh? And R.C. Sproul's remarks 
to this question was, what's wrong with you? That was his remark to the crowd, because these were questions given by the crowd. After he had been teaching on the grace of God and how we don't deserve it at all. And he's, he's like, what's wrong with you? And people are laughing. He's like, I'm serious. What's wrong with you? You don't understand the, the holiness and righteousness of God, how, how we as humans, we can't comprehend it. And yet God was so gracious in that very next day, he clothed Adam in righteousness by killing an animal, which means he's going to kill his own son. And it's like, we, we always, the world cannot see this. It's got to be God revealing it, like he has to us, that he is more gracious than he is judgmental in a far, far way. Because we should have been burnt toast right at the beginning, right? Um, when James and John said, you know, send down fire, <laughs> That, that should have been happening all the time, especially with us, as soon as we we're born. But God is so gracious to give people who blaspheme Him daily that breath that they're breathing and the ability to utter out those lies and heresies. That, what a God we serve. Uh, to put that all in perspective. And this is Jesus. This is our Jesus. He's my Jesus that I walk with, and you walk with, who has power and authority in this world. And he's given that to you, to live out, to speak forth. And that love, that staying love, to be with people, even if they turn on you, that's the way we love, right? I'm sorry to go a little bit longer, but that's the way we love. Jesus said, if they ask you to go a mile, go two. When the gospel's involved in this and you're preaching the gospel, you take it further. You live it out in front of them. And we are the staying people. Not that we always do, but we want to reflect God in that way. Right? Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word and Christ coming alive here. Um, that we are not ever hung up on judgment. That judgment is always there to bring us to you. Because in you, there is safety. There is hope. There is nothing that can touch us. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is nothing that can separate us from you and the love that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing in this world, nothing Satan can do, nothing that we can do. We are one with you forever. And Father, we pronounce this to the world, this truth that God is a God who stays and is a passionate, merciful God, and yet He's righteous. He does not allow sin to stand even in our lives. He disciplines us for sin. We, ha we do not have a license to sin. We've been called to righteousness to live that out. And as we sin, we confess it and come back to the truth that Christ has died for me. I am to be holy as you are holy. Father, make us a holy, separate people. Continue to sanctify us. And you do that through our work, through your word of taking it in and, and, and meditating upon it. Father, may we do that and remain in step with the Spirit that He may teach and guide and lead us and give us the words to speak in this wicked, passing world. And I pray for the salvation of many. And Father, I ask for this church that you do immeasurably more than we can ask or even comprehend. And I know you are. If 
Thank you. Be with them this week. In Jesus' name, amen.